Awesome. So this webinar is being recorded again. Welcome. We are at today's webinar, Preparing Your Workplace for Peer Integration. Um, so feel free. I want you all to like use the chat box, introduce yourself, make comments, let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, the link to the recording of the webinar is going to be emailed, so you will receive that um, email within one week, as well as any materials that we'll be referencing in today's webinar. Um, note as well, when you're using the chat box, we just want to make sure that you are um, speaking to the correct audience, so just check that your chat box is set to either panelists or attendees, um, whoever you mean for your message to be. Um, a lot of participants always ask about whether we um, issue CEUs, and we do not offer CEUs, but you will be able to receive a link um, to receive a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, and I will be dropping that link in the chat box. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and introduce today's presenter. We have Stephanie Ramos, who is the Communications Director at Cal Voices. Stephanie is a family member of someone living with a severe mental illness. She has served as Youth Advocate, Family Coordinator, Director of Education, and now Communications Director for Cal Voices over the course of 16 years. Her work has included grassroots local advocacy efforts in Sacramento on various boards and committees, including serving as co-chair of the County Mental Health Services Act Steering Committee. She has facilitated numerous focus groups for peers and TAY in the public mental health system and works for employers across California to implement and improve peer support programs. Stephanie has provided training throughout the PMHS for many years on a number of concepts and modules, her acumen for understanding organizational culture and shared decision making related to MHSA community planning process brings added value to Carl Voices. Thank you so much for doing today's webinar, Stephanie, and I will go ahead and come off camera and, and you can take the floor. Great, thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone um, for joining. I'm really excited to be here. We do, you know, I've done a lot of work here in California, but it's always nice to be able to reach out, um, you know, across to other states and be able to share the great work that we're doing. Um, a little bit about Cal Voices. So we're a nonprofit 501c3. Uh, we are an affiliate of Mental Health America and we're founded in 1946. So we're the oldest continuously run uh, consumer operated peer run agency um, in California. Um, we have over 78 employees and 98% of those employees identify with having some type of lived experience, whether it be as a consumer behavioral health services um, or a family member like myself. Um, we have over 15 programs that provide direct peer support services within different settings, whether it be uh, warm lines, wellness centers, clinical outpatient programs, inpatient um, programs, and other settings. Um, we also have programs that do local advocacy and public public policy analysis, and then we have we're able to provide training and education um, on recovery oriented services on peer support and a variety of other topics um, throughout California's public mental health system. Um, so today you are here to talk about preparing your workforce and workplace for peer integration and you know it's it's really important for us to think about you know, when we're integrating peers into our workplace, whether we've done it already, or if it's something that we're looking into doing, um, to figure out kind of where we are, right? Really think about, you know, is our agency, is our team willing to address and make genuine efforts to overcome common challenges and barriers to integrating peers? Um, do we understand and value the peer role? Um, does our agency, does our team possess and demonstrate core competencies? And I mean, employer core competencies, not necessarily those peers. And are we, you know, ready to foster and promote a psychologically healthy and safe work environment? So those are things we want to consider um, when we're bringing peers into our workplaces. So as a manager or as a supervisor, the fundamental purpose of your job is to bring out specific intended and desired results in your programs. You have an affirmative duty to protect the agency against any foreseeable risk. And you need to know your contract, right? Your scope of work, your deliverables, work plans, timelines, budgets, inside and out, 
so that you understand what outcomes you're expected to produce, what it's gonna to take to achieve those program objectives and how your team will accomplish this together, right? So not only knowing what we, what we need to do, but also thinking about how do peers kind of fit in um, to our contracts, to our work plans, to you know, the outcomes that we're expected to achieve. When we're thinking about you know, accomplishing goals, meeting our contract deliverables, as managers and supervisors, we are the ruler of our realm. Um, the performance of our staff, including their ability to do their jobs well and complete tasks on time, directly reflect on your skills as a manager. And so to accomplish meaningful results, you need to know the exact outcomes expected of your program and how to accomplish them within the parameters identified in your contract and what tasks and job duties are required to complete your program deliverables, how you're gonna assign them and the skills and attributes employees need to effectively perform them, right? So before we're uh, hiring staff, picking which peer we wanna have in our program, we need to figure out what skills and attributes do we need to accomplish the goals that we're looking for, right? So that's gonna help us figure out, you know, what are we looking for in the folks that we're hiring? So as a supervisor and manager, um, we also have to be looking at risk avoidance and mitigation. So we have an affirmative duty, okay? That means we're actively on the lookout for possible problems and potential solutions. And we're addressing issues proactively, not reactively. Um, and we also wanna look at foreseeable risk, okay? What does that mean? So foreseeable risks are risk or risks that are predictable regardless of how likely or unlikely they are to occur. Um, if Anyone, your manager, another manager, anyone in the agency has ever mentioned it, the risk is foreseeable and you're expected to recognize it and take steps to avoid it. And many employment related problems are easily avoidable if you draft and adhere to effective job descriptions, right? And one thing that we've seen throughout our work is that um, job descriptions aren't always very thorough or thought about as being an essential tool in ensuring that folks are um, successful in their role. So thinking in your head, kind of, you know, what are problems sometimes that go wrong, um, you know, in the hiring process or once somebody comes um, on board and what are some ways you've kind of learned to avoid those issues? So we've developed a checklist for success when it comes to integrating peers into your programs. So we wanna first assess your organizational competencies and work culture. We wanna work with existing staff, ideally before we bring peers on. We wanna use a slow and methodical integration process. We wanna hire more than one peer in each program. We wanna ensure that peers are making living wages and have opportunities for professional growth. And we wanna ensure that peers have a direct line or report directly to a high level administrative staff member. And when you get the email later on with uh, the information from this webinar, you'll also get a handout called Core Competencies for Peer Employers um, that you can kind of review and go through and see um, you know, are we as an agency, as programs, ensuring that we have core, the core competencies, core competencies needed to successfully support and expand our peer workforce? So number one, we want to assess our organization, right? So we want to figure out, again, are we willing to address and make genuine efforts to overcome common challenges and barriers to peer integration? Do we understand the val and value the peer role? Do we possess and demonstrate the 11 employer core competencies, right? And again, you'll get a handout that'll list what those competencies are. And do we foster and promote a psychologically healthy and safe work environment? So those are some things like when we're assessing, are we ready to bring on peers? Um, are, if we already have them, how are we, you know, kind of doing the work that we need to do to ensure that you know, their time spent with us is um, healthy and enjoyable, and that we're also getting the most out of um, having peers within our programs. So there's uh, three necessary qualities, you know, that we need to consider um, when we're assessing our organization. And it's really thinking about, you know, are, are our programs, is our organization recovery oriented, right? Are we person-centered and not analyst-centered? Are we client driven and not professionally driven? Are we strengths based instead of being deficits based? So thinking to yourself, why is that recovery oriented work culture essential to peers workplace success? And when we're thinking about person centered, it's really broad focus. We're looking at all of somebody, not just their condition. Um, you know, we're, we're ensuring that we're supporting folks in a way that's goal driven 
And we're really working to help people rebuild their whole lives, not just looking at their illness. Um, we also want to ensure, you know, when we're being client driven, we're looking at recovery in a way that it comes from the person, right? We're not giving them recovery. Recovery comes from them, that it's individualized, that we're able to work with folks in a way that shows collaboration and partnership. Um, and then are we being strengths-based in how we're providing support and care? Are we building on what's right? Are we developing resilience? Are we supporting independence and personal empowerment? And though you might say, okay, well, that services, what does that have to do with peers? Well, how we treat our clients really kind of sends a message to peers what we think about them, right? Do we think the folks that we serve can recover? And if, we, and if we're not showing that, what does that kind of um, say to our peer staff? Do we think that they have recovered? Do we worry that, oh, they're going to relapse, they're going to get sick again? Um, so how we treat our clients in care can send a message to our peer staff. And so we wanna be ensuring that we're really developing a recovery oriented workplace and providing services in a way that is recovery oriented. So how recovery oriented is your workplace, right? So think about what are some things that are going well in your workplace? What are some things that could be going better in your workplace? And what can you personally do to improve the recovery orientation of your workplace, right? So when we're, when we're assessing our agency for, you know, bringing on peers, we're really thinking about, you know, are, are we being recovery oriented and how we're providing services and how we operate and how we talk about clients when they're not around? Are we really focusing on recovery? And then we want to look at psychological health and safety, right? So when we think of, you know, the workplace, we're not always thinking about the psychological impact that it may have on people. And so when we're talking about psychological health, we're talking about our ability to think, feel, and behave in a manner that allows us to perform effectively in our work environment, our personal lives, and in society at large. And when we're talking about psychological safety, that deals with the risk of injury to psychological well being that an employee might experience. And it's important to note that psychological health pro problems occur on a spectrum, right? From mild psychological difficulties on one end to severe psychological disorders on the other. Um, and the most common psychological health problem in the workplace are anxiety and depression. And they actually account for a large portion of the negative impacts on employees and employers, right? And there's two. Uh, kind of bigger risk factors when it comes to, um, you know, folks developing anxiety or depression in the workplace. And that would be um, having high demand, right, on productivity, getting things done, but having very low control in how we accomplish that. The second risk factor is putting out a whole lot of effort, but getting very low reward for the effort that you're putting out. So those are the risk factors here. Um, there's more risk factors, but those are kind of the ones that we've seen that kind of rise above that are having the biggest impact on folks. So a psychologically health and healthy and safe workplace is one that promotes employee psychological well-being and actively works to prevent harm to employee psychological health due to negligent, reckless, or intentional acts. So when we're talking about risks, right, what is the risk of having an unhealthy and unsafe work environment? Well, first, it's legal and reputational. So it could include risk for harassment, discrimination, bullying, work comp claims, and lawsuits. Uh, there's a business risk. It can affect productivity. Uh, we may see absenteeism, presenteeism. Um, it can affect the quality of services, employee and client engagement. We may see burnout, turnover. Um, we just might not be able to sustain the work that we're doing. It can impact growth, and it can also um, have a really large impact on morale in the workplace. The other risk that we see too is health. Um, so we may see increased disability, increased stress, trauma. Um, there could be, you know, we could see a creation or exacerbation of mental and physical health conditions just by having an unhealthy or unsafe work environment. So there are 13 psychosocial factors um, that you want to kind of take into account when we're considering, you know, is my workplace psychologically safe? So that's having psychological support, having a positive organizational culture, having clear leadership and expectations, having an expectation of civility and respect in the workplace, having a good psychological job fit, having opportunities for growth and development, 
And then we also want to ensure that we are providing opportunities for recognition and reward, right? Are we recognizing when people are doing a good job? Um, do our staff feel like they're involved so that they have influence in the decisions that impact them? Um, is there opportunities for workload management, right? Are folks kind of feeling like they're overworked, don't have enough time or resources to do their job effectively? Are employees engaged? Are, you know, are we having conversations about work-life balance? Do folks have the tools that they need to really do that? Is there psychological protection um, in place in the workplace? And then are we also looking at physical safety? And psycho, psychosocial factors are elements that impact employees' psychological responses to work and working conditions, um, potentially causing psychological health problems. And the psychosocial factors include the way work is carried out. So deadlines, workload, work methods, and the context in which that work occurs, including relationships, interactions with managers and supervisors, colleagues, coworkers, as well as clients and customers. So these 13 organizational factors that we went through were identified by researchers at Simon Fraser University, and they're shown to have the greatest impact on organizational health, the health of individual employees and organizational costs, including the way uh, work is carried out and the context in which that work occurs. Um, and so, you know, in our workplaces, we really have a crucial role in at least protecting and possibly promoting um, dignity and respect for the person, right? Serving basic needs for the sense of self-worth and self-esteem, um, you know, providing security, um, integrity and autonomy of the person. So kind of serving their need to feel safe, both physically and psychologically. And then lastly, organizational justice. So where we're serving the need to feel that someone belongs to a community where there's respect and due process and fair procedures for everybody. So to one degree or another, these 13 psychosocial factors all revolve around the protection and promotion of kind of those three major clusters of needs and rights. There's been a lot of studies around this um, and there's a handout that we'll make sure that you get as well. It's actually two handouts. Um, one of them is called conducting an organizational review. So if you're a manager or supervisor, you might wanna check that survey out and it's gonna ask you a lot of different questions about your workplace from like, benefits, wages to, you know, are people taking their breaks to, you know, are we promoting that work-life balance? And then there's also a survey um, called Guarding Minds at Work Survey, and that's a survey staff can take, um, you know, asking them, do they feel supported by their manager? Are they, you know, encouraged to take their breaks at work? Um, there's, there's a lot of different questions that it asks. Um, and there's a lot of information. Um, if you uh, go online and check out Guardian Minds at Work, um, they have a whole kind of um, process you can undertake as an organization to kind of assess your, um, your agency, your workplaces, and how you know, psychologically safe they might be, help you go through those surveys and develop an action plan from that on how to increase psychological safety in uh, your specific workplace. So with that information, think about it. You know, what are some things that are going well in your workplace? What are some things that you could be doing better in your workplace? And what can you do personally to improve the psychological health and safety in your workplace? So the second part on our checklist was work with existing staff. So we've done some, you know, assessing our agency, where we are as far as recovery, psychological safety, but now we want to look at you know, how are we working with our existing staff before we bring peers on? Or maybe it's after we bring peers on. You know, how are we working with our, you know, clinicians, social workers, community health workers, nurses, um, clinic managers? How are we working with all of those folks to ensure that when we're bringing in a peer or if we've already brought in a peer, it's done so in a way that folks understand the role, right? So we want to start with explaining the role. We might even share the job description. Um, and ideally, we want to do that before we bring a PR onto the team, because that way everybody kind of knows where they fit in, what their job is, how, they, how their duties kind of align and fit in with the duties that other folks may have on the team. We also want to explain the employer competencies to them. So as an organization, what do we need to do to ensure that peers are integrated effectively into our programs? We want to share our vision for the role in the program. Right. So what do we hope is going to be accomplished through bringing peers onto our team um, or what did we hope 
when we brought peers in, you know, what would be accomplished, how the team would work, what would what changes would happen in our program. We ideally want to gather input and generate buy in before we bring the peer in. And we want to address and dispel any common myths related to peers in the workplace right and and working with existing staff is really important because. Um, you know, sometimes we especially um, I can speak for California if if we're you know working in the public mental health system so usually you know services offered through counties through a state plan. Um, folks that are often qualifying for those services they're going through it right it's not most people don't qualify for that service because life's great right they're having a lot of challenges and to maintain those services and eligibility you still have to be having a lot of challenges so if we're working in systems where we're seeing most of the people that we're seeing are struggling sometimes we kind of forget that this is a very temporary place in their life and their future might look very different than this and so we want to ensure that you know our staff are are in a place where they're thinking about recovery, where they're thinking about the potential of the folks that come in to get services and supports, because that may um, really kind of have an impact on how they treat somebody living in recovery coming in to be their work, their coworker. So there are some common myths out there around um, peers specifically. Um, and one of those myths is that peers can't work, oh, they can't work full time, they can't take it or they can't provide mental health services or that they'll relapse right and the funny thing about that is well, couldn't anybody um there's another myth that peers are too fragile to handle job stress or that they can't handle the administrative demand and another myth which can be very hurtful is that peers will cause harm to clients that professionals will have to undo um, there is a handout that you'll also get um, when you get the information from this webinar. Um, it is a report uh, from an organizational organization called RAN that did a study in California around the peer role. Um, it's called uh, Mental Health Consumer Providers, a Guide for Clinical Staff. And it talks about kind of the misconceptions and the myths out there that a lot of folks have about peers in the behavior health workforce and then it is able it also provides a lot of rebuttals like well here's what you think but here's the facts um, to kind of help do that work um, ahead of time so that we're creating a welcoming environment for peers right and we're having high expectations and we're treating them like you know they're my coworker, just like anybody else on the team um, because without that sometimes we can see a very kind of toxic work environment for our peers where a lot of these myths um, can kind of, if people believe them, we see that sometimes play out in their behavior and how they're treating peers. So the third uh, point on our checklist is to use a slow and methodical integration process. Um, there are many workplace factors that are necessary to the successful implementation of peer support services. Um, so we want to start by ensuring that we're adopting a recovery oriented mission, vision and values within the programs, agencies and systems that we're working in. And you'll see it's at three levels, right? Program, agency and system. So if I'm working at the program level, I might not be able to change my whole agency. I might not be able to change the whole system, but I can at least have an impact on the program that I'm working in. If I'm in at the agency level, I might not be able to change the system, but I'll have an impact on my agency and the programs that I'm working in. And if we're at the systems level, we can start to, you know, create trainings or provide technical assistance or recommendations or mandates for our agencies and programs so that they're really um, moving towards a recovery oriented service delivery. Uh, we want to ensure that we're modifying any policies to foster the inclusion of peers in the workplace. So we want to review and revise any policies and procedures. Um, we want to develop policies and practices that promote recovery principles and recovery based outcomes. Um, so review and revise goals um, or kind of any outcomes that we've placed kind of as expectations within our program. Um, we want to, you know, review and uh, revise any measurement and evaluation tools are we only measuring um kind of clinical outcomes or are we measuring recovery oriented outcomes like do people feel empowered do they feel like they have control over their lives um, those are things we want to be measuring within our systems as well we also want to uh, refine any um 
practices to reflect uh, emerging best practices, emerging best practices, um, evolving any expectations, and also incorporating any lessons learned. Um, and we ultimately want to ensure that we're incorporating peers as equal and essential workforce participants in all aspects of system development, right? So if we're at the system level, if we're, you know, putting funding opportunities out there, if we're designing new programs, how are we ensuring that peers are part of that design and development as they roll out? So additionally, we wanna ensure that we're clearly defining staff roles and responsibilities. How are the roles different and how will those responsibilities coordinate with one another, right? If, if the peer is, um, you know, working in a, kind of one as a, a staff as part of a clinical team, how are they working collaboratively with the clinicians, the case managers? How are they supporting um, the peers in, you know, reaching any goals that they've collectively developed with the team? How is the peer helping to, you know, kind of integrate more recovery oriented goals for that person, addressing their health, their home, their purpose community. So how is the peer bringing recovery orientation to the team? Uh, we wanna foster team building and collaborative opportunities, right? So really reminding people that we're people, right? And our relationships as coworkers is important and it, it affects our own psychological health and safety at work, regardless of who you are on the team. And we want to develop a performance improvement framework with providers and peers to improve their knowledge of and competencies in delivering recovery oriented services right so if we're truly recovery oriented within how we're providing services it's going to kind of trickle into how we treat our peer workers. Because we're all about empowerment. We're all about, you know, people having a hopeful future. Um, we're all about individuals reaching for their full potential. Um, and that will trickle down to how we treat our peers. Um, and so another handout that we'll send out is the SAMHSA core competencies for peer workers and behavior health services. Um, and that's just important when we're defining roles and responsibilities, when we're creating those job descriptions, when we're explaining what that peer role is, um, so that we're ensuring that we're utilizing peers in our programs in a way that's evidence-based. So with thoughtful integration, we want to figure out what programs are peers going to work in. Great, we hired them, but where are they going to work? Who's gonna supervise them, right? So when we're thinking about supervision, are they only gonna have clinical supervision? Are we creating peer supervisor roles where we might have individuals who worked in peer roles, supervising individuals in peer roles, right? Who get what the role is, who get the challenges of being someone living in recovery, working in the behavioral health system, um, ensuring that there's some type of peer supervision included. Um, what duties will that peer perform? And that's another piece and something that um, I think that as the peer workforce has expanded, you know, over the last couple of decades, a lot of peers started kind of saying like, oh, you're hired, here's your desk. And then the question is, well, well what do I do? Um, and when we're not clear in what program they're going to work in, what their duties will be, what performance expectations do we have, then we kind of see peers flounder and aren't reaching their full potential because the direction that our other staff kind of naturally get our peers sometimes aren't getting um, when they come into the workplace. We wanna figure out what potential barriers to integration are existing, whether that be policies and procedures, whether it be um, other staff who may hold some kind of stigma around working with individuals in recovery, um, you know, what else exists? And then what about long-term growth and development for peer programs and positions? Um, one of the challenges in um, expanding the peer workforce and is that we lose really great peer staff, really qualified people, people who bring a lot to the team and a lot to our community because there's no next step for them. We can't, I came in as a peer, but what's next? Can I be a supervisor? Can I be a manager? Can I be a director? Can I work as part of quality management? Can I be an evaluator? What is, how are we creating a career pathway for peers in a way that they can be a peer still? Because a lot of times what we hear is when um, peers might say, oh, well, I want an opportunity to move up. The answer is, oh, we'll go back to school and become a case manager. But it's like, what if I want to maintain my peerness, right? How are we creating a peer career pathway for individuals to maintain and stay within a peer role, but have an opportunity to move up within the system? 
So now we want to consider what training are non-peer staff going to receive, right? Especially those who are going to supervise and direct work directly with peers, right? Are we going to give them training on recovery and recovery oriented services? Are we going to provide them a training on what peers do? Um, so they understand how their role is going to collaborate and work with uh, different peers in the system. Um, you know, are we talking, are we having conversations about microaggressions? Like, are we providing training to the non-peer staff, not just the peers? What training are peers going to get when they come in, right? Not just on the peer role, but how does your agency work? How do the programs work? What trainings do they need to really kind of understand how their role fits into the bigger picture? What are the performance expectations? How do we know peers are successful? How do peers know they're successful? How do they know if they're meeting those expectations? What are the core competencies for peer support workers? How are we gonna measure their performance? How are we gonna evaluate their performance? Are we using a standard evaluation that everyone gets or are we tailoring it to the role of peers? And how do we prevent and address performance issues? That's an important piece too. And I think because sometimes of stigma and as a result of that low expectation, sometimes performance issues don't get addressed because we feel bad or they can't take it. And when we kind of go in or we're too busy, right? And when we go in kind of with that mindset, rather than addressing things early and often, we wait until there's we've gotten to the point of no return and a peer may lose their job. So we wanna ensure that we're being really thoughtful about that. Um, I saw in the chat, Billy asked, can we provide an example where there are career pathways that allow peers to maintain peer peerness? Um, so within our organization, we have um, kind of like our entry level positions, we would consider our youth advocates um, and our warm line uh, team who are kind of taking uh, non-crisis calls to support folks. Um, our youth advocates work in the community with young people um, as part of teams really helping youth engage in their services to set goals, to you know, build their independent living skills. Um, and then we have our peer partners or peer specialists um, who work in clinic settings, right? So they, they might be part of multidisciplinary teams. Um, on the entry level part, I always want, also want to mention we have wellness centers where they're peer run wellness centers, people come in from the community. So sometimes we have people start in those roles then they move up to a peer support worker, peer support specialist working along, you know, alongside clinical teams, um, part of those multidisciplinary teams within uh, maybe county systems. And then we have some contracts with Kaiser, right? Part of their, um, uh, what is it called? I don't remember what the program name is, um, but we're, we're there working with folks who have um, higher needs where they're utilizing the emergency room more and the peers might be more um, supportive in those roles. Um, and then we have our peer supervisors. We have our peer managers. We have our, um, uh, advocate liaisons that work within uh, county systems where they're sitting as part of management teams, um, you know, being the voice of our, our clients and consumers and our family members at those management tables helping, um, you know, inform policy decisions or, you know, uh, program guidelines and things like that. So, um, you know, I, within our organization, we're peer run, so it's easy to kind of build that ladder, um, but also kind of looking within, you know, if we're in county systems and we have a quality improvement um, division or department, do we have a designated peer roles there to ensure that we have the peer, the client family voice as part of those, those evaluation teams and looking at what we're measuring, interpreting what we're measuring and things like that. Um, so data collection and recovery outcomes, I think kind of goes in line a little bit with my last comment. Um, we want to make sure that we're creating a mechanism for peers and people in recovery to define outcomes and train people to understand them, right? What are, when we're talking about recovery outcomes, it's not necessarily, oh, this person is having less symptoms, right? But again, do they feel empowered? Do they feel like they can, they have control over their life? Um, do they feel like when they're in a crisis, they know what supports that they can reach out to. Do they feel like they can manage their crisis? Um, do they you know, feel connected to enough resources in the community that they don't feel reliant on a treatment team? Like what are other, ha have they rebuilt relationships in their lives? Do they have meaning and purpose and opportunities for contribution? So really thinking about you know, what, what do recovery outcomes look like and how do we start to try to track those within our programs? Um, we want to ensure data collected captures de captures desired recovery outcomes. 
Um, we want to increase the accessibility of data by using creative ways to share that information, whether it be fact sheets, intranets, podcasts, you know, public forums, like how are we sharing information about recovery outcomes? Um, and we want to increase research into recovery oriented practices and peer provided services. So if you're a researcher out there, this is a great topic to jump into. If you're um, a hospital system, a county system, how can we start kind of researching recovery oriented practices and collecting that data so that we can build more evidence around the, you know, effectiveness of peer services and not just peer services, but recovery oriented services within our systems. So the fourth piece on our checklist was to hire more than one peer in a program. Um, and this is important because it promotes cultural transformation. So it's not just the kind of one peer in the room that has a voice, but we're having multiple peers, you know, as part of our teams that are engaging in discussions about how we're doing things within our programs. It also provides peers with necessary peer support. And um, sometimes, you know, if, uh, and I've been the only peer on a team too, is that uh, we might hear something that kind of throws us off a little bit. Maybe it's a comment that's made about a client. Um, maybe it's a comment about the peer. Um, and it's important to have somebody else to kind of bounce off of and be like, was it just me? To get a little bit of peer support themselves. Um, or if they're feeling like they've been treated unfairly in the workplace because they're the peer, they're the one that lived with lived experience, um, it's important to have somebody else to kind of maybe validate or maybe kind of bring them back and be like, oh, well, I didn't see it that way. But having somebody who's also, you know, in a similar position as them because it is a unique role and it's a very unique experience working within the behavior health system. It also strengthens, strengthens and reinforces the peer identity, right? So it helps us to maintain our pureness, right? Because we have somebody else that we're, that is doing similar work as us that we can be um, bouncing ideas off of, um, learning from, you know, how each other are implementing or what, what the core competencies look like within how each of us might be providing um, different services within the system, um, sharing, you know, what's working, best practices we've learned, things like that. And then it also prevents isolation and co-optation of the peer role. And um, co-optation is most commonly defined as professionalization. Um, so it's the adoption of values, attributes, and the style of personal interactions associated with uh, professionally credentialed staff members, um, or kind of a drift towards a more traditional service practice. Um, and so I know that for me, um, when I was a youth advocate, I was one youth on a, a clinical treatment team and it was me and it, I think it was maybe like six and it was six other people and I think or maybe eight other people and it was like clinicians, the psych nurse, um, the case manager, the clinic manager, all of those folks and I was very young I was 19. Um, and when I look back I realized I started talking like them, I started using clinical language, I started using uh, stigmatizing language like frequent flyer. Um, and I realized I did that because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted them to see me as an equal member of the team. I wanted them to know that I get it. But my role was to bring recovery oriented language to the, to the table, talk about people in a way that is strength based, bring that youth voice to the table. And I think part of the challenge in doing it is that I was the only one there, right? And there wasn't another person to um, kind of, you know, uh, rub shoulders with it. We're doing similar work and be more, feel more empowered to speak up, uh, feel safer to speak up around things that were said um, and really model what being recovery oriented was supposed to be. Um, so that's, you know, really important when we're thinking about how we have how we're designing our programs and thinking about having more than one peer there. So the fifth uh, piece on the checklist is living wages and professional growth. So peers are often paid less than other positions with comparable responsibilities, like mental health workers, community health workers, uh, sometimes case managers and service coordinators. Um, peer, uh, we see a lot of peers come into the field and they're making minimum wage. And um, I think all jobs are important and valuable and bring, you know, a contribute to our community. But if I, you know, have to pick between, um, you know, working at in and out for $17 an hour and not deal, having to deal with people's like life challenges or pay, 
or getting paid $15 an hour and taking, taking on, you know, and sometimes an, the emotional toll that goes in with pay, with providing mental health services, I might go, I might go serve food because just the weight of that work isn't as, you know, impactful on my emotional well-being as providing mental health services. And so, you know, really thinking about, are we providing an appropriate wage for the services that we're asking people to provide? Are we providing them with a livable wage? Are they having to get a second job because their peer support job doesn't pay enough? We've also seen peers being restricted to temporary part-time or extra help roles. And with that, it creates a second barrier. So not only am I maybe not making um, enough wages to just have one job, but if I'm temporary part-time or extra help, I likely don't qualify for health insurance. And that one kind of blows my mind because I'm like, I'm knowingly hiring people who are working on their recovery, maybe living in their recovery, not providing health insurance. Um, so, you know, it's something to keep in mind. And I, I also, and in this, this bullet, it says peers are often restricted too. So I also want to say there is a need for temporary part-time and extra help roles as well, because we also want to create opportunities for peers who might be new in their peer role, who, who maybe don't want to take on, you know, that full-time multidisciplinary team work, but figuring out how are we creating that career pathway, right? From entry level all the way to those advanced positions. Um, and then there's a lot of agencies that don't provide opportunities for professional growth in peer roles, and they have to provide clinical education or some type of other training to move up. So think about expanding peer employment, right? So there's a lot of entry level opportunities like volunteering, um, extra help workers, part-time, temporary employees, uh, maybe folks doing transportation and community support. We have wellness centers, folks can do outreach, they can be part of welcomings and orientations. But then we wanna think further, okay, what's down the line for them? So do we have program leads and coordinators for peers? What about program supervisors, managers? Do we have client advocate liaisons? Um, are they part of our cultural competence teams at our uh, kind of systems level? Are they part of our quality improvement teams? Could they be our mental health director, right? So peer positions are often structured as a one size fits all kind of model. And there, you know, there needs to be options, but if we truly view peers as a valuable complement to clinical services, we can start getting much more creative in the opportunities we provide to those workers. And peers, just like anyone in any other role, want realistic chances to advance in their career. So those opportunities are gonna keep employees engaged, reduce turnover, and promote the provision of the quality of services. So the last piece on our checklist was allowing a direct line to leadership. And this is, doesn't mean that all the peers get to run directly to your executive director or that all your peers get to run directly to your mental health provider all the time. But it ensures that the position, program and work activities align with the intended vision and organizational values. And it prevents and addresses issues such as stigma, discrimination, harassment, bullying, co-optation and role confusion. So even if you know I'm a peer working in a wellness center, I don't have direct line to you know, our executive director. But if we have a peer manager, there's that line, right? There's that, oh, I have peer staff and we have a peer supervisor and we have a peer manager. So the folks in those leadership roles understand the issues that are going on with our peers. And in turn, that voice is at that table where decisions are being made. So definitely, you know, look at this checklist. You know, are you, ex are you assessing your organizational competencies and, competencies and work culture? Are you working with your existing staff? Are you using a slow and methodical integration process? Are you hiring more than one peer in a program? Are you ensuring peers are making living wages and have op having opportunities for professional growth? And are you ensuring your peers have a direct line to a high level administrative staff member? Things to think about. Um, you're going to get a bunch of handouts that hopefully can help uh, support you and kind of going through this checklist and improving your workplaces. So I think we can open it up uh, for questions and discussion. And
Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I think we all really appreciated this webinar. Um, so one of the questions that we did have um, coming out from the chat is handling microaggressions in your workplace for peers, right? And you know, microaggressions for peers is like on so many different levels in terms of stigmatizing of your um, mental health condition, but also, you know, any other demographic characteristics. So how do you um, suggest that, you know, persons on this webinar on whatever level they are navigate these microaggressions? Yeah, so microaggressions sometimes are intentional, right? And sometimes they're not intentional. People don't even realize um, that they're kind of, um, so their behavior is a microaggression. And so we always uh, encourage peers to address them, right? To not let, leave them unaddressed. But I also wanna preface that with saying, do so if you feel safe, right? And I don't mean someone's gonna beat you up, but I mean, um, do you feel safe in that I, you know, I'm comfortable I'm comfortable bringing this issue up because I know I have job security. I'm comfortable bringing this situation up because I know I'm valued and supported in my role. Um, so when folks don't feel valued and supported, they don't feel that they have job security, I wouldn't push them necessarily to address it unless they were comfortable. Um, but I always, I mean, my approach is always, I noticed, I, you know, I noticed you had said this, or, you know, I heard this, or I, you know, just kind of, I noticed and being as factually, as fact-based and objective as possible, right? Rather than saying, oh, you were rude, but being like, oh, I, I, I overheard you say, or in the meeting, I thought I heard you say, and being very clear in what the statement was and say things like, I, you know, I was wondering what you meant by that. So I'm not accusing them of anything, right? I'm not attacking them. I'm not interpreting what they said right? I'm giving opportunity for somebody to clarify. And often I found that um, when folks, uh, a lot of people kind of like when they say it back or think about it, they're like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to like bring that up. And you'll, you'll know really quickly whether someone was being intentional and trying to kind of like stir the pot and say something not nice, or if maybe they didn't even think about it until you brought it up and they're like, oh my gosh, like, I, I can't believe that. And so I think addressing them is important, again, knowing if you're safe. And if you have another peer that was there, you can always check in with them and be like, was it just me? Or was it kind of weird when they said that? I felt a certain way. And so you kind of have someone to check in with to before you kind of, you know, make that approach in trying to address it. But I think, it, you know, if you're, if, you, if you're safe in doing that, um, I think addressing it is really important and doing it in a way that's not shaming, right? And doing it, you don't want to like just call them out in front of the whole room because we also want to create an opportunity to bridge a relationship, right? And create a place where somebody can be vulnerable because they feel safe doing that with us. Yeah, I love that response because I think it it also carries us back to what a peer is supposed to be in terms of just like activeness, listening, non-judgmental -judge attitudes, you know, and I think that the way that we engage with each other, even within the workplace, is supposed to show that, you know, peer recovery oriented approach, which is supposed to be distinctly different, right? Um, so another question that we had that just came in, uh, are there any kinds of best, best practice guidelines that may summarize what um, good organizations do better? Um, I'm assuming they're meaning like, like what, are, what are the best practice guidelines for peers? Um, so, there, so there's a lot of information out there um, on the best practices for peers, but I would start with the core competencies and then, um, if I can find it, um, I will send it to you, Kat, to send out. But there's a document that SAMHSA has around all of the kind of different settings that peers are working in and can kind of they can kind of show you like what those different roles look like and, and how they're operating and utilizing peers in those programs. Um, but there are also best practices for employers. And so in the handouts that you'll get after the webinar, we're also going to include our core competencies for peer employers. Um, and there's kind of a list of uh, competencies that we encourage peers to kind of build within their organization. Great. Um, so an interesting question that we got is, you know, as a as a peer, especially if you're the first time peer going into the workforce, sometimes you may have to do a lot of convincing on your end in terms of convincing agencies to recognize that you're a leader, you know, convincing agencies to to not stigmatize you. You know, how 
do you navigate that and be able to convince you know persons that you can do your job effectively and still be a peer and still you know value you know your recovery process right so i think um it's making sure that you're solid in your role i think that's a big piece of it right because we can kind of talk all day but but what we do, right, what we do is more powerful than kind of what we say. Um, and so I think like ensuring that we're really grounded in our core competencies, we have really good boundaries and how we're working with individuals. We know how to skillfully talk about our own experience. I think that's a really big piece, right? When we're, and, and some, a lot of times as peers too, like when we're as part of a team and, you know, maybe we have they're, the team is talking about a particular case that they're having challenges with and they don't know why. As peers, we can share, you know, a little nugget of our story where maybe we had a similar challenge and then be able to share, you know, what worked for us, what was helpful, but doing that in a way that's very skillful, right? It's a, it's a tool. It's not our only tool. Um, and then I think, you know, I think in, engagement says a lot. So as peers, I think part of our role is helping our, you know, the individuals that we're supporting and engaging in their service and feeling empowered. And when we're, you know, we might have our team say, oh, these people never show up or they don't participate in our, in our clinical meeting. And maybe you get invited to go to one that, you know, you, you support an individual and you say, hey, you know, I'd be willing to go with you or let's prep you for that next you know, meeting that you're going to have with your psychiatrist. And then they show up with their questions that they're ready to ask. They're very succinct in what they want to report out. And all of a sudden they're like, well, that was different. Right. And so being able to kind of show the impact of peers. Um, and then one tip I definitely have is that as new staff come on, because it's always harder to go back and change a team that you are new to. But if you have new staff come in, get to know them be, you know, be one of the first people that are like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy to have you as part of our team. I wanted to definitely share with you like what I do in my role, how I can be a support and, you know, bring added value to the work that you're doing, um, you know, how I can be helpful. So I think sometimes it's really, or not, not sometimes, always um, engaging those new team members that come in, right? Because those will be kind of often new allies if we can bridge those and build build and bridge those relationships as early as possible. Yeah, I love that tip. I think relationship building is going to be so important. I think that's one of the beautiful things about being a peer, right? Like, I feel like we have a unique stance of sharing our lived experience and using that lived experience to really just like bridge that gap. Um, you know, so from from Stephanie, you've done this like for years in terms of speaking about these issues. Um, what uh, if if a peer agency or, or anyone trying to bring in peers into their organization, thinking about you know who supervises peers, who's the best person to to help this process and guide this process? You know, there they are like you know differing views of like whether a clinical person should should be lead, whether a peer should be a lead. You know, um, I know my view, and you know I just wanted to know if you could um speak to that like what. How, how do you navigate? And also, if there's no other option and a clinical person has to be the lead, how can an organization navigate that as well? Yeah, so I think peer supervisors are essential just across the board. We need peer supervisors. Um, and thinking about that as we build our programs, right? Because when we're having peer supervisors, we're having folks that can relate to some time, to some of the challenges that our peers are experiencing in the workplace. So, you know, I, and, and I've managed and supervise peer programs. And when my staff would come to me and say, you know, at, I was, you know, I was going, I thought I was going to be invited to the clinic, the clinical team meeting for this youth I was working with, and they never invite me. And I don't understand like why. Right. And I'm like, oh, I've totally been there. Like I under, totally understand what you're saying. And maybe it has to do, it could do, it could have to do with maybe they're having, you know, maybe the youth didn't want anybody else there. It could have been that maybe the, you know, the clinician at the time didn't know, you know, that you were available. Maybe they didn't know the value or what you would bring to having, you know, to being in that room. So, you know, as the man, supervisor, I'm not being like, oh, they, they all suck, but, but kind of being able to go through, well, what could the contributing factors be here? And also because I've been up here knowing sometimes these other things play out just because I have lived experience, right? So maybe again, going back to, am I going to do harm that another professional is going to have to undo? Um, but also as, you know, 
as a individual living in recovery, supervising other folks living in recovery, you know, if someone's struggling a little bit, I might see it ahead of time, right? I've been there. Like, I'm like, okay. Or um, if someone's struggling, maybe, you know, I've, I've had to, I've had to cope with my struggling on my own in the workplace too. So I might have strategies that I can share with them, um, you know, help them, you know, try to come up with their own strategies about how to kind of get back on track or, you know, deal with things that are going on, you know, with them personally that's impacting the workplace. So it's never like part of the peer supervisor is never about um, going softer on them or, you know, having low expectations, but being able to use their experience as a peer and using their lived experience to bring their staff up to empower them, to share what worked. So, I mean, not necessarily always being their peer, but they, but, but like peer workers, we're able to share our experience and empower our staff, right, to do better, to see themselves in somebody else who's, who's advanced in their role, right? And so I think it's, it's important for the supervision piece. It's important for them to maintain their peerness, Right. So me being able to always refer back to, well, how did you use your lived experience in this? Right. And figuring out, well, did they do it effectively, appropriately, um, all of those things. And and it's the career ladder. Like what else is next if we don't have peer supervisors? Right. Am I stuck in my $17 an hour peer role for the next 15 years? And I'm going to have to go work at you know, be a car salesperson because that's the only way for me to make more money. Or I have to go spend all of this money to go back to school that I don't have because I'm only making $17 an hour to become a case manager. So I think it's helping peers um, feel supported, ensuring that peers are maintaining their peerness, right? So we're having that regular interaction with someone who really gets what I do um, and creating those career ladders. And then I think lastly, making sure that that voice is at the table where decisions are being made that impact staff, right? I'm going to be readily and always having that peer experience in the front when I'm, you know, in my meeting with other managers and supervisors so that peers don't, peer issues don't go unaddressed in the workplace because they often have unique issues that they experience that might be different than other folks they're working with. That was a long answer, but. No, that was, that was amazing. And I love the fact that you have, have touched so much on career advancement for peers, because I think that is such a, a needed conversation that, you know, people don't just want to say peer support specialist, like there needs to be upward mobility. Um, so we just have about two more minutes. Um, so Stephanie, I don't know if you have any last words for our audience um, to end off our webinar. Um, well, I mean, I, I think I've talked about career ladders a lot. So I think that that's important because we have really great qualified staff and we will lose them to other systems, other agencies, um, just because of the lack of career advancement. Um, wages are so important and wages. I mean, it's like we need folks to have a living wage, right? I don't want to decide to stay on social security because I can't afford my health insurance because my job doesn't pay me enough. Like, we need to really be thinking about, you know, what, what do people's like, what does their future look like? If we're talking about being recovery oriented, like we need to play that out in our workplace too, not just like in the services that we're providing. If we think, if we want to say, oh, all of our clients can get better, we'll prove it, right? Prove that you believe that. Are we hiring them? Are we creating career advancements? Do we have peer managers? Do we have peer supervisors? Are, you know, are we investing in kind of the, what we're preaching out there. So I think that that is really huge. I think do not discount the amount of stigma that exists in the workplace. There's a lot of stigma with, I mean, there's, and a lot of it goes unsaid, it goes unaddressed, um, but it's there. And really, you know, thinking about, you know, who are our peer leaders in our agencies and, and giving them those opportunities to really step up and shine, because I think that's how we change minds. Right, we sh we show what peers have the potential to do. Awesome, um, Stephanie. I know in the chat I saw that there were people who were interested in getting in touch with you after today. So maybe if you want to share how they can do so. Awesome. So we have that information on the screen. So if you want to get in touch with Stephanie through Cal Voices, um, definitely um, take notes of the information, web, email, phone, and social media. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Stephanie. I think this was such an amazing webinar. So powerful, so much information, so much resources, um, and just like 
discussions that we really need to have within the peer world. Um, so just to reiterate everyone, you will receive um, the recording of today's webinar along with a link to get the certificate of attendance, as well as all the handouts that Stephanie mentioned during this presentation. So you can expect that in your emails within one week, um, the email that you use to register for this webinar, um, we will be sending that information to you. Thank you all for being here um, and have a good day.